We are recording. Great. Okay, so getting right into things today. So thank you for joining us. This is a session on evaluating the Create PT like a reader. This is feedback that we've heard from you all that you want more of sessions like this. So uh, we are hoping that this serves your needs well. So I am Crystal Furman. I am the director for AP Computer Science. Uh, joining me tonight is my colleague and partner whenever we do these webinars, Maureen Reyes. Maureen, you want to introduce yourself real fast? Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Great. Okay. Um, our agenda tonight, I'm going to do a very, very brief overview of the Crete Performance Test. That was part of the webinars that you watched ahead of time. So I'm just going to do it just to kind of refresh people's memories um, as to what that's all about. I'm going to do uh, some a little bit longer time spent on the Create PT scoring guidelines, mostly looking at you know, a few tweaks that we made at the reading last year. These have been posted online on AP Central since August. So the, the changes are very minimal um, and they've been out there. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was this post about, you know, oh, the, the scoring up gui guidelines have changed. They've been out there since August and the changes you'll see tonight are extremely minimal, but I'm gonna make sure everybody's clear on that. You were asked to review samples A through E uh, in the um, homework, and you were asked to score those. Hopefully, you got a chance to, even if you didn't record it into the survey, hopefully you got a chance to do that because we're going to go through those uh, and, and mostly just focus in on areas where people maybe had some questions and misunderstandings. I'm going to talk about avoiding plagiarism this year. Um, that's uh, a soapbox that I'm standing on right now, and then we'll have some time for questions. And I'm going to try to answer questions that you put into the feedback, as well as questions that are in the um, Q and A as we go along. Uh, but we'll save time at the end as well. Okay. So real briefly, everybody should know this: the Create Performance Task has three parts. The kids have to create a program. They can do this collaboratively. It has to have a list in it that they're using to manage complexity. It has to have a procedure that includes an algorithm. Um, and it has to have input, output, some kind of functionality. And they should be centering this around a purpose. That makes this um, easier to do. They do have to create a video of it running. We have some video requirements there. Then they have to answer written responses. There are four of them. So 3A is about the program functionality. 3B is about the lists and how it's managing complexity. 3C is about the procedure that they write that includes an algorithm. And 3D is about testing. Like I said, I was going to go through that super fast. All right, let's get into the scoring guidelines. Um, as you may know, there are six rubric rows for the scoring guidelines. Please, please, please give your kids not just the scoring guidelines, but the test directions as well. That is what you're asked to do and what you attest to do. They need to read both um, because there's some nuances there. So we're going to just pause. This is going to be our first poll for tonight. Um, so let me get this going. Let me select the right question. Okay. So here's your first poll for tonight. Can students receive partial credit for a rubric row if they meet some of the bullets, but not all of them? I got almost everybody, another 30 seconds, less than that, because we need to move forward. All right, and so here are the results for that, most everybody knows, no, they cannot. They have to meet all of those little bullets within that rubric um, scoring guideline box in order to get the rubric row. They cannot get partial credit. This is a, either they get a one point or a zero point for each rubric row along here. So um, they should kind of use these bullets as like check boxes. Did they cover these things? And we put check boxes in the student handout so that they can, um, they can see those as they go through. Um, the rubric rows are rated independently of each other. So one of the questions that we get all the time is about rubric rows four and five. And Daniel asked it tonight. He said, what is up with rubric four and rubric rows four and five? Does the algorithm have to be in the procedure or does it not? In the scoring, in the scoring guidelines, we 
are trying to judge whether or not a student has certain understandings. And so we've broken out, do they understand how to write a procedure from do they know how to write an algorithm? If they want both rows four and five, yes, they have to put those two things together as outlined in the student handouts. That's why I say you need to give the student handouts to them because that's what they should be following. Now, when it comes to rubric row four, what are we looking for? We're looking for, do students know how to write a procedure and have that abstraction where they have a parameter that they're using within this program? Do they have that? What if a student doesn't know how to do that with a procedure? What if they use, what if they think on events are student driven, um, student written? They're not. Um, so they wouldn't get row four. What if they don't know how to write procedures at all, but they know how to write algorithms? We want to be able to allow them to get row five, which is about algorithms, even if they don't know anything about procedure and vice versa. And I think people are okay with the fact that if a student has a procedure and they don't have all the elements of the algorithm, that they get row four and not row five, but they get a little twisted up when students can, what do you mean students can get row five, the algorithm, without it being in a procedure. So hopefully you're starting to see that, like we've teased that out, so we're not double dinging kids where kids are oh, I don't know how to write a procedure, so I can't get four or five. Four is about the procedure, five is about the algorithm, but they need to have them together to get both of those points. So I'm gonna mark that one as done that I've answered that question there for you. So, okay, moving right along. You will notice in the scoring criteria, nothing changed from when we posted our scoring guidelines before the administration for 2021 and after, and that is because the scoring criteria matches one-to-one -one with what we're asking in the test directions. This was feedback that we got from teachers. Teachers were really unhappy with, um, with the nuances between the, the test directions and the scoring criteria. So we've made that really aligned tightly. So you can see here, the video has to have input, functionality, output. That's what we have in the criteria. When we get into the written response, they have to describe the overall purpose of the program, describe what the functionality is, describe the input output. So there's that one-to-one -one correspondence there. All right, so let's get into each rubric row. Rubric row one, again, we are about um, doing the input, the output functionality in the um, video. And then we're writing about the purpose, the function, and the input output. What changed in this row? I moved the period. That's all. Nothing dramatic changed between what we started out the reading with and what we ended the reading with, except for that little period got moved. Okay, looking at the next row. In the next rubric row, we are looking at, do they have a list? Do they have a list? They've named the list, described what the list contains. That naming of the list is really super important because without naming the list, we don't always necessarily know what students are talking about. So it's really not something that we're looking to understand a student understanding there. It's really just a directive. Hey, this is the list I want you to grade. So um, that is in there for that reason. What we did here, the change we made was we uh, decoupled that bullet under do not award a point if. So um, we had them together. We really don't wanna, if it's, it's more of an or than an and. So use a list that's trivial, readers struggled. What do we mean by that? So we defined it. We changed that to a list that is one element. They have to have at least two elements in their list. Otherwise they are um, considered trivial. And then it does not assist in fulfilling the, the program's purpose. So students just added a list to add a list. Okay, number three, um, this is about managing complexity. We are going to look at the code itself and does the code manage complexity? And then we're going to look at what they wrote. Does, is that managing complexity? Uh, somebody wrote in the chat, well, you doubled in here because if they didn't name the list, then you're not going to give this point. Right, because we don't know what they're talking about. If they have multiple lists in there, it's very difficult for readers to understand. So they do have to do that, that basic thing of like telling us what they're talking about in their written response. This row didn't change. This one was identical. Uh, row four. Now, what we did in row four was we added a bullet. This is about the procedure. Do they have a procedure? Does it have a parameter? And then what is describing what that procedure does? Why we had to add this bullet was we decided to create some leniency in row six so we don't double dig kids there. 
So if a student wrote a procedure that didn't have a parameter, they were losing both row four and row six. That seemed a little harsh. So we are allowing them to earn row six if they have implicit parameters. And we had a sample out there that did this. So we needed to say, well, in row four, you have to have explicit parameters. So we've defined it and we've put it into row four and you'll see later on in row six, we allow for implicit or explicit parameters in that case. So a little leniency there. Uh, in row five, we're looking at the algorithm. It needs sequencing, selection, and iteration, and they have to explain how that works. Um, what we changed here is we, uh, we changed the word main from main procedure to identified because some languages have a main method and we didn't want our readers to be confused by what we meant by the word main. So we made that change there. All right, I have a quick poll for you on this row. So let me pull that up. Does the sequencing selection and iteration need to be in a student developed procedure to earn this point? And Crystal, while you're waiting on the results from that, um, some of the attendees have asked you to slow down just a little bit. Okay. All right, I'm going to end the poll there and share the results. So they have to be in a student developed procedure. Um, they don't have to be in a single one. So we see examples where students are in one procedure and they call another student developed procedure. So as long as what they're calling is also a student developed procedure, we can look inside of that one as well to see if they have the selection and the iteration that is needed. So it has to be in a student developed procedure. A lot of students are putting things in on events and that's where they're losing the points for, um, for, the, for the procedure. Um, but this is, this is row five. This is about the sequencing selection iteration. As long as they're calling another student developed procedure and that has those pieces in it, that'll be fine. And we're gonna look at an example tonight where they actually don't do that. And that's why they don't get the point. They call a built-in procedure. Okay, let's stop sharing those results. Row six. So I get this question a lot. Daniel asked it. He says, does this need to be multiple calls or can it be one call with different arguments for the parameter? So in their program itself, when it comes to making calls to the procedure, they just need to call it one time. And that's assessed in row four, that they've called it at least one time. Here, what they're doing is they're describing, right? So it's this describe two calls. Those can be hypothetical calls with fake values. So um, a lot of times the students are passing a list, you know, it's good for them to um, pass in values that, you know, make certain things true to go down certain paths that are true, and then have a list that has values that would make things go down another path that is false. It's hypothetical, so they can make it be whatever they want. Um, it to be. Um, Adam asks, does row six have to be a true false call? No, they, they, uh, they're going to pass parameters and those parameters will, will adjust that true and falseness of uh, the different pack. He said I answered, so good. All righty. What changed here? Uh, quite a bit, but it's all in the scoring notes. The first thing is we had this bullet that said um, the procedure is not identified in 3C or the procedure does not have a parameter. Well, we just said we wanted to give some lenience there between um, row six and row four. We're gonna take the parameter off in row four and so we wanted some leniency. So we took that part off, you can see that. And then we added all of this information about the implicit parameters that we have. And then we also, to help our readers um, a lot of times people are looking at two paths and they're thinking, oh, they have to have an if else. They don't have to have an if else. If they have an if that doesn't have an else, that's okay too. So that's this um, third bullet where they could bypass code, right? So if it's true, they're going to do this. If it's not, it's going to skip over that. That's doing nothing is doing something different. Um, 
So it could, could be two paths or it could be that they hit it, hit it as true and they skip it if it's false. Alrighty. I'm gonna mark that as done. Okay. The other thing that we have here is um, a definition. We added those implicit and explicit parameter definitions to the scoring guidelines. And that's at the very end, there's a list of definitions. Okay, I'm gonna pause right there and see what questions we have before we move forward. So Crystal, you said that because as somebody was just asking about the definition of implicit and explicit parameters. So you're saying that definition is in the scoring guidelines. They are, they're in the scoring guidelines. Explicit are gonna be right in parentheses right after the procedure name. So it's whatever they're, they're passing explicitly. Implicit could be like, for example, um, a lot of times there's global variables like in uh, App Inventor and things like that. So they're pulling a global variable in, that's, um, that's gonna be an implicit parameter. Hopefully that helps. Um, there was there was some confusion in the beginning, um, so just take us back a, a few steps. Um, people are saying they hear task directions and student handouts interchangeably. Are these the same thing? And then um, just explain that this is different than the scoring guidelines. I think people are confused about the the names we're using for everything. Yeah. So the the student handouts actually include the task directions as well as guidelines for students as to what they can and cannot do during the exam administration and some tips for like what they should be doing prior. Um, so within the student handouts are the test instructions. They should get that PDF, that student handouts PDF, and then the scoring guidelines PDF is found um, on the exam page on AP Central. Actually, both of those PDFs are found there. Um, they, so one question here, um, can student get the full points if their list and procedure meet the requirements? However, some part of their program is not optimized. Uh, so I think that depends on the rubric row. Um, there, there are sometimes there's, you know, if it's looking for does this manage complexity like row three, then they may not get it, even though they have a list in there. They'll get it row two because they have a list. But when we get to row three, we're going to be like, okay, you use the list, but you didn't use it. To manage complexity so you're not going to get row three so we'll see some examples of that tonight um so this is a this is about collaboration we always get questions about collaboration there's still confusion about what does it mean that students can collaborate does it actually mean that they can work on the same project together and then individually submit their written responses or does it mean that the two of them uh, the students simply help each other, but then they each work on their own project and written responses individually. There's still some confusion there. Yeah, um, that is a that's a great question, and both of your um, suggestions there work for collaboration. Uh, so that's probably why it's a little confusing because collaboration can look like many different things. So it can look like two students working on the same exact project together. They could be doing that in a pair programming situation. They could be doing that in a divide and conquer situation where each person is taking a part of the program and then they're putting that together. Um, but you're right, the written response has to be written independently. They could do the other suggestion that you had, which is, oh, I'm going to work on my project. You're going to work on your project. But maybe you do some testing for me, or maybe if I get stuck on something, you can be my sounding board for that because I can't ask my teacher. So that is another way that they would go about doing some collaboration. Both of those ways is, are valid. Um, there's a question about row 3B and 3C. Um, can the code snippet for row 3B and 3C be the same as long as they meet the requirements? Yep, absolutely. They can be the same. Okay. Um, I don't know if you address this. Do procedures need to have formal parameters? So they need to have formal explicit parameters for row four. Um, if they don't have them, it is still possible for them to get row six if they have some implicit parameters. So there's a follow-up to the collaboration question. <laughs> there's one that says, um, Wait, you mean students can work on the same programming? Yes, I mean students can work on the same program. Yep. 
Okay, another question. If a mouse click is on a call based upon location and that event calls a function, getting the X and Y location, does different clicks count as different calls? Yeah, I think so. Yep. Okay. Yep. Those would be the parameters that are being passed. We do one or two more and then we need to probably move forward. Move on. Okay. Um, let's see. If a student creates a list that's initially empty, but then populates it via an iteration, for instance, a re like reading a file, would that list be valid? Yep, but then what are they gonna do with it once they populate it, right? That's step one, that's populating the list, but then now what are they gonna do with it? They've got stuff in the list, but then they have to do the processing of the list and, and doing something with those values. So one, all right, one more question about list and then we'll move on. If a student uses more than one list, should they put all of the lists they created use uh, in the written response? Yeah, all that's the where- they use, yeah. That's where it gets really tricky for readers because um, they're trying to read this response and they're trying to see, does the student really truly understand? Students are trying to communicate their understanding to the readers, right? So that's why uh, it sort of depends. If It's better if they can just choose one of those lists as an example and really focus in on that one list and like what that one list is doing, even if it's working with some other lists as well, they really need you to, to focus in on one list and what that one list is doing in the program. Okay, do you want to move on? Uh, I'm going to answer Corrine's because she, okay. she put a follow up about collaboration and can the whole class work on the same app um, as long as they source each other. So here's the thing. If I have a class of 30 students and they all want to work together, their program is going to have to be really, really big and really, really involved if each one of those 30 students are going to be actively involved in the creation of the program. They cannot just sit back. They have to be an active, engaged participant in that work. So if, they, if they're like dreaming pie in the sky, first, I would not ever advise this. I would actually advise my class to stick to groups of two or three. But if they've got pie in the sky dreams and you've got uber time, because if you're making a huge program, you only have 12 hours to do it, you may need more than 12 hours if they're going to do that and work as a group of 30 to make a super involved project but they all have to be actively involved in the creation. It can't be something that like two people do and the rest of the class share it. They're not gonna be active participants and they're not gonna be able to answer the questions. So I don't advise it. Two to three is more manageable. Um, I think they're gonna bite off way more than they can chew and you're gonna have kids that are not actively involved in the creation of that project, which means they didn't collaborate and they cannot use that as part of their written response. They have to be active. All right. All righty, let's move forward. There's lots of great questions tonight. Thank you all. All right, let's look at these samples that you pre-scored for me. Sample A, I'm gonna walk through all the rubric rows in sample A and then I'm gonna pick and choose some things in B through E, but if you have questions, we'll, we'll answer those as well. So the big thing right off the bat that we're going to talk about is purpose versus function. And I put the definitions that are at the end of the scoring guidelines in here. Um, purpose. This is the problem that's being solved or creative interest being pursued through the program. Function. That is the behavior that the, that the program is doing. What students did was they wrote function in both places. That's what you're going to see. Um, you're going to see them talk about what it does in both places. They really need to understand the purpose. Why are you making this? And so that's why I suggested in the video I did for students that they think about that first. Like, why do you wanna make that? What is that gonna be used for? And um, you'll see in this first example, uh, and somebody had some had a really hard time grading this one because none of it, it didn't have a purpose. It was very difficult for us to understand why would we use this? Um, and so then that made it, it challenging to think about the list separately from that. So here it is, let's, let's look. So the first thing that we're looking at in the video is do they have input? They do, that's some clicking on these buttons. Do they have functionality? Sure, it's doing stuff. And what's the output? These bar graphs that are, that are changing there. So they are gonna get these first three bullets. Notice I'm checking off my bullets as they go. Remember, no partial credit here. 
All right, moving on to their written response. Okay, so they start to talk about their purpose and they say the purpose of the program is to create randomized data. And then they go on to like further talk about that. That's not a purpose. That's what it's doing. That's a function. I don't know what they're using this for. What does this data even mean? They also have a purpose down here. Now, if this purpose here was a good one, we would take it even though it's in 3AII. When we say it has to be in a single response, it all has to be in 3A somewhere, but they can look in the different sections to find it. But this is not This is a repeat of before. The purpose is to organize the data in the list and then display it through bar graphs. Basically, more glorified purpose. So they're not gonna get that. So this is a tough poll, um, but I'm gonna start it for y'all. What might be a good, acceptable purpose for this program? Let's see what y'all come up with. All right, 10 seconds. I struggled to come up with some for this. I wasn't sure what we would use this for. So I'm hoping you came up with some good ones. Let's see what y'all came up with. Um, yeah, sharing. I don't see him. Do y'all see him? Nope. Maureen, do you see answers? I just see the question. Hmm. All right. Well, that one is a bust. That one was an advanced poll. So maybe I'm hoping maybe it gets stored with the with the Zoom and maybe I can share those out separately. A lot of people are saying they don't see the poll. Um, so it's a pop-up window. So if you have pop-up windows blocked, you might have you might not be able to see the poll, but it is a pop-up window. Okay, well, I can't see your answers, unfortunately. Um, some people didn't see it. So I think this one was an, it said it was an advanced one and not everybody might, might not be able to see it, so. Okay. But Crystal, to this point, we did see, um, I did see some questions about the purpose. So, you know, one person said, can, you know, quote unquote, entertainment be a purpose? Another person said, you know, creating data is a purpose. So can you, can you talk through some of these um, misconceptions? Yeah, so we really wanna know like what problem are they solving? So gathering data for what? Why are you gathering data? Um, entertainment, uh, that's where it gets into this creative expression. I think a lot of times we take that as minimally acceptable. Um, Usually if it's like to teach somebody something, it's a game for educational purpose purposes or um, entertainment, unfortunately, <laughs> has been legitimate. Um, it, but I think we really want to challenge students to have more of a, um, a deeper reason. Like, why are you generating this data? Just to generate it? For what purpose are you generating it? So, um, Hopefully that doesn't mean you all steer your kids toward doing something for entertainment because that makes it an easy answer, but um, it, you really want to make it engaging for them. So why do they want to do it? Let's think about that before we start doing it. Okay, anything else, Maureen? You're muted. Sorry, I don't see anything else about 
purpose. Okay. Yeah, great. And we'll see a couple other ones. And I have one that I do actually have a good answer for. Okay, so then when we look at the functionality, they've done a, done, they've done a good job with functionality and they have described the input and the output for this program. So they get those points as well. Okay, looking at row two. So for row two, this is about the list. We want a list that's populating the list. Um, or, or code segment that's showing lists being populated. Some people have asked, like, do we just, you know, an instantiation with an empty list, does that count? If it doesn't, we need to see data being put into the list. So that's what they're doing here. They're picking random numbers and putting it in. Uh, and then this second code segment is them using in the list. They are using the list. They're going through and they're doing some sorting either from least to greatest or greatest to least. That's what these code segments are doing. Some people had had questioned whether or not these were legitimate. It's, it's legitimate. Um, they're they're doing some really good sorting there. Um, did they identify the name? Yep, sorting numbers. And what is it representing? Numbers that represent the heights of the bar. So short and sweet, but they get the points for those. Okay, row three. Now we're going to look at. Um, does this manage complexity? So when we first look at bullet point one, um, I took some of the scoring notes and I put them in here as well. We're really looking for like, is this list, are they using it in a relevant way? Um, is it being used in the program? It is, they're using it to do these sorting things. And then um, we wanna look at like, how are they using it? Uh, and would it result in a program that's easier to maintain? Meaning that if we change the size of this list from five bars to 10 bars to 100 bars, would, would we have to change anything about their code? And we wouldn't. It, it actually is um, written pretty well to manage complexity. But we're looking at the code for this first bullet. So that they're going to get that. For the second bullet, we're looking at their explanation. and seeing do they explain how they're managing complexity here. We wanna make sure that what they're saying is plausible, that it's accurate, that it's consistent um, with the program, um, that if they're offering up an alternate solution, that that's something that's actually plausible. So, you know, if they've got like a, a huge list of, you know, 10,000 items and they say, oh, I can just use variables for that. No, actually you probably cannot use, just use variables for that. That's probably, um, uh, unrealistic that that's what you're going to do. So um, they shouldn't say that. They should say, I really can't. I have to use a list in this case. So it's okay to say I have to um, use the list and explain why. Uh, and so this is where they have it. It's kind of a minimally neat. Um, it's, you know, I think we'd like to see a little bit more here, but they talk about, you know, having to use individual variables and um, they go through and they say how they would have to change every single one and so they are going to get this explained. All right, row four. In row four, we are looking at the procedure. So here's where they're defining their procedure. Student developed. Its name is bars. It takes a parameter, so that's good. And here's where they're calling it. Bars one, two, three, four. Now, somebody asked about, does it have to be optimal? This is not how I would write this program. I think this is not actually optimal the way that they're doing it, but this is the way the student thought to solve the problem and um, it, it works out okay. Um, when we get into the description, they describe what it does. They say it contributes to the overall function by allowing the bars to be organized based on, and this is just a description, not an explanation. So that's all good. All right, getting into row five now, we're looking at sequencing, selection, and iteration. Someone asked what sequencing is. Sequencing is just doing things in order, one after the next, after the next, after the next. So if a student has selection, which is an if statement, and they have it, or they have iteration, they're also gonna have sequencing because they, are, they have multiple statements. As long as you have more than one statement, you have sequencing. So this has multiple statements. It has sequencing. Sequencing has to do with the order. 
Here's where they have selection. This is their if statement here. It also has some nested if statements inside there. So they do have selection. And they have iteration with this repeat five on the outside. So we're all good there. Let's look at their explanation and detailed steps. Am I gonna be able to map this to their code? So um, the first thing they say is that first a counter is set to one and the variable y is set to negative 260. That's this part of the code here at the top with my little brace. And the next part they say, um, then if the list number, which is a variable that is part of the procedure is equal to counter, then new y is set to y. So that's this if part here. Then they say, if list number and counter aren't equal, we add 60. And this is the part at the bottom actually. So if that if statement isn't true, it's gonna jump down to the bottom. It's gonna do this adjustment. Um, then, the if statement repeats five times. So that's what their repeat is. It's a little out of order, but I get what they're saying. And then they talk about the inner if. Um, if the number list and counter are equal, then we broadcast uh, the specific sprite associated with the list number. And that's what all these little if statements are inside there. So I've done a good job. I've been able to map it I, step by step. I could re recreate this. So that's pretty good. Okay, row six. We need two calls to this procedure. Each call must pass a different argument and cause a different segment to, um, different code segment to execute. Now they've used, uh, ooh, I almost gave the answer. Let me ask this question of you. So what type of parameters are being used here with this bars? procedure. Okay, 10 more seconds, implicit or explicit. Don't be shy, take a guess. Okay, so when we have the parameter next to the procedure name, that's actually considered explicit. They've, they've stated explicitly what it is there. So they are using explicit parameters. They are they were eligible for row four, right? So they got row four. So they had they had to have had an explicit parameter in order to do that. Um, and they have an explicit parameter here. So that's good. Okay. So here's their first call. They say. Um, list one, list number is equal to one. Um, that's their first call. They're passing a one here. Uh, what that's gonna do is it's gonna check this, it's gonna set the counter, it's gonna set y equal to a value, it's gonna do this repeat. It's gonna check that if statement. And what they didn't talk about, which I feel like is lacking here, so this is very minimally met. What's lacking is that they, they don't talk about what's in number list. And that's really important to this first if statement here. So number list, uh, I'm sorry, the sorted numbers. Sorted numbers is probably what I would consider implicit here. So they have this implicit parameter sorted numbers. Crystal, um, people are having a really hard time seeing the code even when they zoom in. Can you zoom a little bit in? I don't think that I, I don't know if I can. Will this zoom it in? Oh, look, look at that, learn something new. Um, it's still a little you, hard to read though. Yes, yeah, you all have a copy of this in the, in the um, homework, it's all in there. So maybe you can pull that up if, if that's possible. Um, 
So the sorting numbers, the list that they have, that would be what I would say is implicit. Uh, the list number is the explicit. So this is a great example of how to, what the differentiation is. Sorting, sorting numbers was implicit. That was a global variable for their program. Um, and list number is explicit. So we really needed to know what was in sorting number and have some and more information about that in order to really know what's happening with this first if statement here. But we don't. So assuming that's true, we would come in here, we would um, set y at new y to y. And then, you know, once that's true, because it's going to keep, it's going to keep doing this counting and incrementing until that's true. Um, eventually it will be because they've repeating it five times. Then Num list we or list number we know is one. That's what they said the the call was. So they're going to do that, and then the next thing that they'll do is um, they will broadcast that out. So that's the first call. The second call is very similar. Um, I don't love that we gave credit for this, but we did. It's doing the same thing, but it's actually hitting in this section. So that's the second, that's the second um, set of code that they're hitting. Um, I think it would have been much better if they had talked to us about sorting numbers and what was stored in there. Um, that would have given us maybe like when we would skip over this if statement and, and do the, the, it, uh, the repeating versus when we get right in and we hit a value. So um, it's, it's minimal met for that case. Um, the conditions here aren't described really well, but they are described better in the, um, the first part of this, where they talk about the first calls and uh, what they're describing. This is the other place where it's kind of, that's, if they had had more information about what was stored in the list, it probably would have been better and then identifying the results of each call. So that's the, the bars that they've drew, drawn. Crystal, okay. there's a question here. Does the list need to be filled by user input or can it be pre-filled by the programmer? It can be pre-filled. It can be pulling it from a list or from a file. It doesn't have to be filled by the user. Can you explain a little bit more about managing the complexity with lists? Um, let's see if we can go back to that scoring guideline page. Here I have this, okay. So these bullets right here is where you want to look for the managing complexity. We want to make sure that um, they're using it in a way that is actually making their program easier to write, easier to read, um, easier to manage. So say I start off with five elements in my list. If I now tomorrow have to make my list be 5,000, my program code should be written in such a way that um, it, the size of my list doesn't really matter a whole lot. So those are the things that you that you should be looking for and pointing your students to in terms of managing complexity. Okay. Let's look at the next sample, unless there's additional questions on A, Maureen. Uh, you can move on. Okay. Sorry, catching back up. Okay, in sample B, sample B um, was a weaker sample. It scored points for row one and row two. Some people had questions about the video in this case. So the video in this case does have a spot where it kind of goes black and then comes back on. And somebody said, oh, they shouldn't get it because it doesn't run continuously. What they're doing there is they're doing two sample runs in the video and that's okay. They do like a complete run and then they do another complete run. Uh, and so that's totally fine. What we don't wanna see and what we've seen in the past is like 
like a bunch of screenshots that they put side, you know, next to each other um, to make their video. And that's not the running of the, the program's not running there. It's just a couple, you know, it's just some screenshots that they put together. The other question was about the code and somebody asked like, is there an index out of bounds? And I think this is what they were referring to as random number and will this generate an index out of bounds? And it really depends on the programming language that you're using as to whether or not um, random number will go from zero to words that length or one less than words that length. And so um, I don't know based on necessarily based on the program code, whether that would. Um, I think even if it did go out of bounds there, um, we would forgive it. It's like a off by one error. So um, we, we would be okay with that. It's a little off by one error and we would not um, hurt the students for that. Um, okay, so getting into row three, um, looking at the first one, includes program code segments that show a list being used to manage complexity. So we did not give them credit for this. Um, they, they have the list, they fill the list with random numbers, and then they, um, or I'm sorry, they fill the list with random words from this words list. And then they um, have a little if statement here where they're going through and, and grabbing those words out. Um, they identify the list as list ran words. So that's what they're creating. That's what they're appending items to, to make this random thing work. Um, but it's not necessary what they're doing. They're really not managing complexity. They're actually making things a much harder um, because they already have the list of words and they could have just pulled the random word right out of words. So they're not gonna get this because of that. But I guess my question to you in the poll is, what if the student had identified words as their list and wrote about how words manage complexity? So what if they didn't have this list ran words and they just had words that was like pre-populated somehow and they were pulling from words? Could they get row three? Yes, no, maybe. Okay, I'm gonna stop the poll right there. Um, we've got lots of yeses and maybes. I really can't say definitively that they would. I think they have a better chance of earning this row if they were to talk about words and just not even have this list ran words at all um, because words would be managing complexity in their program. They would be able to grab a random word out of there. Their code would be much simpler. We wouldn't have to do this whole filling the list part, this, this for loop here. Um, we would, you know, however they filled words would be what they would include. And then they would just be generating a random number and, and um, pulling that out here instead of list ran words, it would just be words there. And, uh, and then it would really depend on like what they talked about. Um, what they wrote in their written response as to whether or not they um, were able to get this. Uh, the explanation that they're giving here, so without list, list ran words, the program would not work. This is why they didn't get, get credit for the explanation because what they're saying here is actually not true. There needs to be a list of pre-selected words. There doesn't need to be this List. They can just use words and grab a random word out of words, and it would make this program actually a lot more simpler um, to write and to read and understand. I'm going to stop sharing that. Crystal, we have a few questions uh, again around sure. managing complexity. So, one of the questions is so, if part of the program hard codes the length of the list, will managing complexity be discounted? Most likely. Um, in the scoring notes, it says, 
if changing the size is going to make you have to drastically change your program, then you're not going to get the managing complexity point. Um, and another question is, one of my students asked if it was acceptable to use a list to display game statistics for different players at the end of their game. Will they have a credit for managing complexity for this list? I think, I think I would have to look at that and see. I mean, it sounds like they're managing complexity if they're keeping track of scores and um, high scores. I don't know how else you would do that, um, but to have it in a list or a file or something. Uh, a file is not a list. That's just an alternate way that they could do it. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, let's look at row four. So in row four, um, it says, a student developed procedure with at least one parameter. Their procedure here is time set. It does not have uh, a parameter here. Remember, it would have to be in the parentheses there to be explicit, so they're not gonna get row four at all. Um, I don't even have to look at the rest, but they do not need to do that. Some people were concerned about the um, call here. They said, well, the call is in an on event though. That's okay, um, they, their student developed procedure is time set. That's a function here and that's fine, but um, it's with it's being called within an on event and that's okay. So what they're calling it in does not have to be student developed, just the function itself. And then their description um, describes what the identified procedure does and how it contributes. They talk about it um, shifts 60 seconds in time and how that changes the results. Um, so they would get that description as well there. But they don't have a procedure, or I'm sorry, a parameter. So they cannot get this row four. Moving to row five. Um, so this is about the sequencing, the selection, and the iteration. Again, they have sequencing because they have a whole bunch of code here, lines of code. They've got sequencing. They have selection because they have this if statement in here. But when we look at this bullet, it says, if the code segment calls other student developed procedures, so they have to be student developed procedures, the procedures within the identified procedure can be considered when evaluating whether the elements of sequencing selection and iteration are present as long as the code for the called procedure is included. So they have timed loop. Timed loop may have iteration in it, it definitely is not student developed. And so I don't think they get iteration. How would I know if time loop is student developed or not? How would a reader know? Readers have access to the student code that they submit. So this would be a time where I would be like, huh, I don't know, maybe this timed loop procedure that they've included, maybe that has their iteration in it. Let me go look there. When I look at their code, it's not there. It's not something that the student wrote. So I cannot give them um, a point for this row as a result. Um, explains in details. Um, this is another area where I feel like they're really lacking. This first sentence talks about time loops. Function uses a command time loop to every 1,000 seconds to remove one second from the timer. Okay, so that's that line. And then it says, we'll also check if timer hits a zero. If it's zero, it does something. And that is this line here. But what about all the other stuff that's happening? I don't feel like this is enough detail for someone to be able to recreate it. So I would not give them row five. Okay, row six, um, they needed two calls. This is not a call. This is the function itself, the declaration of the function. So they do not even have one call here at all. Um, and then they, they do no second call. So they needed to have two calls with different arguments. They do not, they actually can't get any of these bullets because they needed to describe the conditions. They don't. Um, identify the results of each call. They don't have any calls here. They cannot describe the results when they have no calls. Okay. Any burning questions before we move forward? 
I've burned um, up almost all my time. <laughs> I know. Can a group be considered a list? And they give the example of, of Python through CMU. Um, I don't know enough about groups. If you would have to look to see if that meets the definition of collections for your program to see if that, that meets it. Um, but there is a definition about what we, what we assume is a list or a collection. It's got to be data gathered together under a name. Anything else, Maureen? I am going to go over. I'm sorry, y'all, but I feel like you have really great questions, and I'm I'm happy to to go on until eight o'clock. If you have to drop, it will be recorded, and I understand that. Um, do you want to continue on through your? Yeah, I'm just going to go slides. a little yeah. little quicker to make sure we get through the slides. Okay, so for sample C, again, this is about function versus per, um, purpose. Creating the game tic-tac-toe is not a purpose. It is uh, what you did. So that's a function. Uh, sample D, they, they also had a function. They said my program calculates the price of pizza based on the size and number of toppings added to the pizza. I had a little fun with this one. I came up with my own purpose here. I said Pepe's Pizza wants to provide more pizza options for their customers. They want to have a custom pricing to adjust the cost based on the size and number of toppings. So that they don't lose money on extra topping requests. There's their reason why they need to do this. Um, my program helps Pepe's Pizza by allowing them to customize pricing for their guests based on the size and number of toppings. So hopefully you can see like the, the difference there. Like why, why do we need to do this? Now I've explained why we need to do this. And maybe that's a little bit more elaborate than we need to go to, but maybe I was hungry when I made that example, Pepe's Pizza. Okay. Um, in Row three for the managing complexity. Um, when we look at this code, what they're doing is they are, um, they've got a list of toppings and they're adding the names of the list to the topping, uh, to toppings list. And then what they're doing is they're creating a string of them. They're just, they're taking them out of the list and, and concatenating them together into a string. And then they're also using the list size to know how many toppings. It actually is much more complicated than they needed to do. They didn't need a list at all. They could have just added the toppings to a string and had a little counter to count how many toppings. And so that would actually be a lot simpler than using a list. So they aren't really managing complexity. They're actually making things more complex by using the list. And then, um, when they do their explanation, um, it doesn't really make a lot of sense because they're not really managing complexity there. Um, sample E, which is our last one, did not get rows five and rows six. Um, and what I want to do real fast is do a quick little poll on this one. It's my last poll of the day. Uh, can a student earn row six if there's no selection in their algorithm. Ten more seconds. I'm gonna end the poll there and share the results. We're kind of mixed here. Most people are saying no. It depends, I guess, on if you're thinking of selection in terms of um, an if statement or if you're thinking of selection in terms of a condition. So it's, I think it depends on how people define selection. When we're thinking about selection statements, Selection statements contain a conditional. Iteration also contains a conditional. And the conditional is what's really, truly important for the algorithm in order for them to earn row six. So if a student had an algorithm that just had a loop in it, they're not going to earn row five, but they still are eligible to earn row six because you can have a, your, your two um, test cases could be one where the loop iterates and one where the loop never iterates at all. 
And like I said before at the beginning, not doing something and skipping over code is doing something differently. That's part of the row six scoring guidelines. So um, my definition of selection being like an if statement or a switch statement or you know not just a conditional, you can earn row six without having selection in the algorithm. You could earn row six with just selection and no iteration. It's really about having something with a conditional in there that's gonna evaluate to true or false to tell me whether or not I'm gonna skip over a code or, or actually get into the body of those things. So the answer here would be yes. So just because they do not get row five here does not necessarily mean they don't get row six. Um, it's gonna be a little harder to do, but it's not a, a total given that they don't get that row. Um, so these are the scoring guidelines uh, for For um, So we use the first code segment as well as any included code for procedure called within the first code segment to determine whether the point is earned. So these are the scoring notes for the algorithm, uh, row five. So we can use um, anything in the call, but you can see that this is the first this is the first um, code segment that it, they included. So when I come back here, use the first code segment, I can only look at this code segment and anything that this code segment calls. So it doesn't actually call this if statement with a loop, that would be what we really needed to see. And so I unfortunately can only look at this to judge whether or not they have sequencing, selection, and iteration. They have sequencing, they do not have selection, they do not have iteration, they don't have a conditional in there. They are not going to be able to get row six because of what they've included here. So they do not get five and six. Okay, just real quick on avoiding plagiarism. Remember, students need to read this plagiarism policy. They need to acknowledge anything that's not theirs. They need to have their written responses in their own voice. Just like if you were writing a research paper, you would not allow a student to take sentences from research and just plop it in their paper and claim it as their own. They cannot take sentences from samples, public samples, and plop it into their written response and claim it as their own. They cannot do that. It has to be in their own voice. They cannot submit anything from practice. Okay, and they're affirming all of this when they attest. That they've and, and here they also are affirming that you've given them the student handout, so make sure you're doing that as well. Here's one way that we see students um, doing some plagiarism in their code. They're just kind of taking this is our online sample D, and they're just changing the, the variable names. This isn't their this isn't their work. They've changed some things up a little bit, but changing the variable names, modifying um, the output line slightly. So instead of right top and sort of left its bottom. This is the same, the same algorithm here. Um, only changing the data source. So instead of pulling movies in, I'm pulling cat names in. Um, that's not going to work. That's, that's using um, something that's come from practice or something that's coming from somebody else. So you can't use that. You need to significantly extend it. This is the other thing we saw. And this goes to what I was saying before, you wouldn't allow a student to take um, sentences from research and just plop it in without quoting, even if they're just, if, even if they're changing a word here or a word there, this would not be allowed. Everything in yellow is an exact identical match. And then they just change things up a teeny tiny bit. This is plagiarism. They're not using their own voice um, and they're not attributing. They are actually doing this method of cherry picking. So, um, we need to make sure that students are putting all their samples aside and that they're really just concentrating on what they know and writing that out. So some strategies, make sure you're extending any existing programming code. So if you did, they did something for practice and they want to use that, they need to add new functionality um, and not use their existing functionalities 
in their um, written response. When possible, I would recommend that collaborative partners use different procedures and lists. I know that's not always possible. So when possible, that would be helpful. Um, avoid using some generic language to describe, especially like in the description for how lists manage complexity. Credit isn't awarded for those buzzwords anyway. They have to be really specific and tied to their program. So this is an example that is on AP Central of something that sounds really good that a student wrote. Uh, the lists are extremely helpful when wanting to store a large amount of values and data. Having the ability to use lists prevent one from having to create a bunch of different variables that would all have different names and only store a single piece of data or a single value. Using a bunch of individual variables instead of a list, make your code unorganized, lengthy, prone to mistakes. A user could possibly reuse the same variable names and delete one of their values altogether. Overall, lists allow for condensed and more organized code. This is something that um, is all sounds great, but is absolutely not connected to their program. I don't even know what their program is about um, in, when I read this. So they have to make those connections. Um, you as a teacher should avoid using sentence starters, provide, providing sentence starters or templates. That's a surefire way for students to get flagged for plagiarism because they're not using their own words now. Um, and use different sample testing data than their collaborative partners. That's helpful too. Um, they should type their answers directly into to the digital portfolio as that account is, isn't shared with anybody else, like a Google Docs could be, or um, a Word document that's shared. Uh, and we can, if they're saving and they're creating the PDFs, then we have some revision history that we can use to look at. Google Docs is fine, but make sure they're not sharing with anybody else. And that is the end, like eight minutes over. Um, I can stand for a couple more minutes for questions. Um, yeah, we're, we're not gonna get to all the questions. There's a lot of questions here, but I, I do wanna say um, for all of you asking, we have recorded this, we are gonna send it out. So you will receive um, a recording. So if you have to drop now, we thank you for your participation. Um, and we will send you the link to this. Um, I have I have a few questions here. So this is actually relevant uh, to what you were just talking about. The, there's a question here. So you know, teachers now they have a better sense of how the scoring works. But what input now are they allowed to give students who are done or almost done with their programs? What kind of input are they allowed to give when looking at a program for students who are currently working on their create performance task? Yeah, nothing specific to that student's program. You could um, take any lessons that you learned from this and you could do a general um, lesson to your whole class about like, hey, make sure you're doing this and remind them about certain things about the test directions. If, if maybe you're feeling like, oh shoot, I didn't cover that enough or I wish I had talked to them more about this particular scoring guideline. It's okay to do that as a general a lecture for the full class. I encourage you to do that. Um, if there's things that you're thinking, oh, oops, I should have spent a little bit more time here, do that. Take take some time out tomorrow and, and make sure that they have that understanding. In terms of specifics for their program, you cannot you can't talk to them and answer those questions. All of that work needed to be done before they started. And so you can only give some some general explanations uh, for the whole class. Okay, we've had one very patient um, teacher here. Um, he submitted a question at the top. He's still waiting, so I'm gonna I'm gonna add it here now. Um, so this is regarding row uh, or or th question three D um, I I I <laughs> is an else you know else necessary. So for example, suppose one value of a parameter results in conditional statement number one being true. Um, and hence the then executing while conditional statement number two is false um, and the then does not execute, vice versa for a different parameter value, or must the student structure the conditional as an if then else thanks? Um, so no, you do not need to have an else clause. Um, this is where I was saying that if you're using an if statement or an if then statement and it's true, it's getting that body. And if it's false, it's skipping over that. The absence of doing something is doing something differently. So you do not need to have an else. 
Um, and the same teacher was asking, this is about prompt 3BII. Does mm -hmm. merely the use of an index from the list featured in 3I count as the same list being used? Um, then he gives an example. So suppose an index of the list is used to do a calculation of some sort. So the list itself is not being used in the in the code in 3BII, but an index from the list is being used to perform a calculation or to do something useful. Um, so, you are using the, you are, I, I'm not sure if I 100% understand the question, but you are using the list if you're using an element of the list. So if you're indexing that list and pulling an element out to do a calculation, even if you're doing one for row two, that is using the list. Um, here's a question. Would a string count as an example of a list or would the student need to use an array list or an array of characters? No, we are not, we're not counting strings. Okay. Um, how much longer? I believe that's so in the scoring guidelines. Um, I would have to double check, but I, I believe that's in the scoring guidelines. Um, and yes, all of the questions here are being recorded, so you will get all of this. Okay. I think some of these we did talk about. Yeah. Um, so there's a question. Can we show students the examples of plagiarism that were just shared here in the webinar? Yes, we actually- Please. We actually did a student direct webinar that's on uh, that's online where we showed them these examples too. So you should have them watch the webinar that we posted where we walk students through these examples and you are absolutely able to show them these examples of plagiarism and you should to help them understand the difference. Yep. Okay. It's called tips for completing. <laughs> your create it's, performance task or something along those lines. Can students use algorithms like finding min, max, average of a list to satisfy the requirements? Um, say again, can students use algorithms for finding min, max? Uh, sorry, just scrolled up. Um, yeah, can students use algorithms like finding a min or a max yeah, of a list? They, they can, mm -hmm. yeah. they absolutely can. Okay. Um, somebody asked about ordering a hard copy of the CED. You absolutely can do that in the College Board store. We still have some of those, right, Maureen? Yes. Um, here's another one on plagiarism. When we say a filter is plagiarism, are students allowed, oh, sorry. It keeps sorry scrolling up. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to find. Okay, here we go. Are students allowed to use traversals for other purposes? Um, Hangman requires a traversal that checks for a value. My students are really worried that any place they traverse a list, they will be dinged and feel like their hands are tied. Uh, for the filter? Yeah that's tied to the filter. The issue with the filter is students are literally using the exact same code from the sample that has filters. They're just changing um, the list that they're pulling their data from. So it was movies and now it's NFL teams and they are changing the condition inside. Nothing else is changing. They're not doing anything with that list. Um, so going through and doing a traversal and searching, that's, that's pretty commonplace. Um, but a filter, they should be do. what are they going to do with that after it? They really need to extend that to do something differently because right now they're carbon copies of exactly what the sample is. And that code literally would take them 30 minutes to write. They're not doing anything with it. This question has been um, asked and, and reiterated here. So I'm going to ask it two calls. Does that mean that if the call appears only once in the code, but arguments to it vary based on the context determined elsewhere. It counts only as one call since that would be only one snippet. Okay, so in row four, where you're doing the call, it's one call. You may only ever call that one time and every time you call it, something different gets passed. 
in row six, you're not actually putting any code there. You can, if you want to, that was another question I saw in here. Students can put an actual call in there, that's fine. You're, you can do hypothetical values though. If I call it with this value, it's gonna do this. If I call it with this different value, it's gonna do something different. That's what we're looking for in row six. So those calls can be hypothetical. They do not have to be in the program. You don't need two calls in the program. Um, there's a follow-up to the um, modifying the min, max. Um, how much do they need to modify it to make it student developed? I think it's more, what are they gonna do with it? What are they doing when they're finding, you know, they're finding them in for what reason? Now what, what are you doing with that? And this goes to purpose. If they have a good purpose, it all is gonna fall into place. Would students be able to get credit for putting letters in a word into a list to do games like Hangman or Wordle, or would that be increasing complexity? I think, I think we would have to see what that is. So it's really difficult to answer the questions about very specific um, things. And, and you really can't give the students feedback on what their specific idea is right now anyway. So um, it, it's, I don't wanna advise one way or the other right. in those cases. Um, did you, sorry, someone is double checking this. Students can earn row five without that code being in a function? Students can earn row five without that code being in a function. Yes, they can. Because row five is, do they know how to write an algorithm that has sequencing, selection, and iteration? And can they tell us about that? That's what we're looking for in row five. Now, if they do that, they won't get row four. So they're, they're not gonna get both rows, but we will count row five. Um, so there's a question here about when a student is flagged for plagiarism. Um, so um, they're asking, we can see their revision history in digital portfolio. The answer is yes, we can see their revision history. Can revision history be taken into account when a student is flagged for plagiarism? Can they submit documentation from another source like Google Docs if plagiarism is in question? So I think this is about when students are flagged for plagiarism. Yeah, um, so when they're flagged for plagiarism, they should go through the plagiarism process of um, doing an appeal. And that could be uh, pointing to the, the digital portfolio and saying like, here's my revision history in the digital portfolio. And we can look at that then. Um, we don't preemptively look at their revision history. There's um, a relatively small percentage of students get flagged for plagiarism, but because we are um, a pretty good high volume course at this point, over 100,000 students, that still means thousands of a thousand kids getting flagged, even though it's a small percentage, it's, it's significant in terms of, I, I can't go into the digital portfolio and check every single one. So they need to, they need to present that evidence for us. Um, here's a question on prompt 3CI. Um, does it require that students need a single procedure that has a parameter sequencing, iteration, and selection? Yes. Okay. It should all be in a single procedure if they want rows four and five. Somebody asked about for row five, when we need to be, uh, the description needs to be clear enough for someone to recreate it. Should we go with a line by line description for that? Um, I think it's helpful, it's helpful for the readers. Um, I would think about it in terms of like uh, pseudo coded out um, so that readers can follow it. I think that's helpful. For students who work in groups, can they use the same list from their program for the purpose of 3B, assuming they write independent responses? Yes. Okay. Um, can they use Unity as a program? Um, I'm not familiar with Unity. Uh, what I always uh, recommend to people with programming languages that I'm not familiar with is I ask them the questions because they should be familiar. Are you able to create something that's like a procedure, it, whether that be a method in Unity or a function or whatever that is? Can you do that? Can you include parameters? 
can you create a collection in there, some type of list that you have to then um, able to manipulate and, and deal with that data? If you're able to do those things, oh, and can you, can you have sequencing, selection, and iteration? If you can do those things, then it's a fine language to use. We're language agnostic, but there's, there's times where um, there's programming languages that I don't necessarily know, but hopefully someone else in the reading leadership will know enough to, to be able to read through it. Um, if a statement covers one condition inside a loop and another, if statement covers the other condition outside the loop, creating two paths, is that okay? Yep. Okay. Um, must the video show all versions of input and output? That's a great question. Um, I We're expecting like a minute long. So I think it's really difficult for them to cover all versions, right? Especially if they're doing something with random or whatever. So a couple runs of it sometimes can be helpful. Uh, to show a couple different paths, but that's not necessarily, we just need to see input. We need to see some kind of functionality and output. That's the requirement. It doesn't have to be every single possible way that, that it could go. Um, there were still follow-up questions about purpose. Um, they're still unclear. So, you know, if, if a student is creating a game is that acceptable or not? You know, so I think to your point, it's about why they're creating the game. Yeah. So it's not it about the game itself, right? But it's about them being able to articulate why they're creating a game for who. It's really about identifying the, the audience that you're creating a program for and thinking about that, right? Do you wanna talk a little bit more about that, Crystal? Sure, and maybe they're creating a game for themselves and it may be right. for entertainment because I'm bored or, um, but really just be thinking about, you know, why are you doing this? And the follow-up, you just said that, are personal interests still okay? So I think it's about yep. how they're articulating that and not the, the interest itself or the purpose itself, right? Yep. Yep. Um, okay. I think, should we... Should we wrap it here? Because we're, we're definitely yeah. way over time. Yep, I um, appreciate everybody sticking with me. <laughs> uh, I, you will get a recording link as well as the, the PowerPoint deck. So those will come uh, to you hopefully in an email shortly. We'll also post these online for people who weren't able to attend. Uh, and we wish you the best of luck to you and to all your students. Um, yes. Thanks for spending time with us tonight. Thank you. Bye. Bye.